Hi doll faces, this is a video for any amongst you who are learning the runes or recapping the runes or would like some simple ideas for how to memorise the runes according to what they look like symbolically. Uh, when I was learning the runes in 2011, I found it very difficult at first to memorise the symbols because they just looked like, you know, a bunch of sticks <laughs> and sort of lines and I found it quite tough coming from a background with tarot which is so unbelievably dense and pictorial I found it really difficult to bond with the runic system initially so what I did was I went through and tried to assign some kind of picture or meaning to each of the symbols according to um, you know what they represent and that's really all I'm going to show you here I'm going to show you the kind of ideas that I use to get the meanings of each rune into my head and hopefully if that's something that any of you need it will be helpful for you going forward so I'm going to start with manas. Um, there's a, this isn't going in any particular order. This is just going in the order that I wrote them down. I'm going to start with manas. And uh, to me, the way that I always remember manas is I think of it as uh, the letter M. And the M in, in my definition of things would represent myself. M stands for myself, the word. Because manas is about self-knowledge. Um, it's about a relationship with the self being primary. And it's about sort of the self being at the centre of the situation, if you like. So for manas, I, I go for uh, thinking about the letter M and I always associate M with myself. Uh, the next one is Nalthis. Uh, now, for this one, it's kind of a strange association, but I always like to see a crucifix with Nalthis, um, really because Nalthis is about constraint and pain and uh, sacrifice, compromise and necessity, those kinds of themes. So it was kind of helpful for me when looking at it, and it does kind of look like um, a perspective of a, of a crucifix or a cross from kind of another angle. So it did help for me to just think about those themes that are so popular with the idea of Christ and being crucified or the idea of having that burden or carrying that weight um, and in a sense also being a martyr. I suppose you could go into that territory with it too. So for me, it's really easiest to remember the themes of Nalthus by thinking about the crucifixion. Uh, Ansu's. Now, with this rune, I like to see an F, the letter F. And the letter F for me stands for forewarn. Because Ansu's is a messenger rune, it deals with warnings, messages, signs, things that need to be communicated to you, things that you are going to be forewarned about. That's kind of one of the central themes with Ansu's. So when I see it, I like to see the letter F, and that reminds me forewarn, and then I go into all of those associations. Um, Isa. Now, with Isa, I like to imagine that this is a person standing alone. Um, because I think of Issa as being the rune of standstill and solitude and kind of withdrawal in a sense too. But the other great thing about Issa is that you can actually look at it as the letter I and you can imagine that the letter I stands for ice because Issa is also the rune that represents um, when things are in that state of, of ice, when things are iced over, when things aren't moving or when they're moving at a very glacial pace. So that's another way in which you could um, kind of connect with Issa if you wanted to. Soelu. Now, I have two different ways of, of reading this rune. The first one, I see it as the letter S for sun, uh, because Soelu represents wholeness and the life force and the sun's energy kind of thing. And the other thing that I like to imagine with Soelu is that this is a lightning bolt to represent energy and life force and that masculine action coming into being, uh, the feeling of something happening, the feeling of it being a game-changing new energy or vibrational frequency that's coming into the mix. So you could really go with either one of those for Suelu. Yera. Uh, this is my favourite rune, Yera. Um, I see the image in Yera as bread breaking. Now the reason that I like to imagine this is because Yera deals with the harvest and the fertile season. And it also represents the reaping of what's been sown over the course of one year. So I like to see it as people getting around the harvest table and breaking bread and sharing with each other what's been amassed over time. Um, and that helps me to connect with the idea that it's the harvest rune. I suppose there's other things as well that you could uh, go into with that. For example, at the harvest festival at my school, country dancing was very popular and maypole dancing. And I suppose you could see this as a, an aerial view of two figures who are kind of arm in arm doing a merry dance. So that would be another way to think of it. But I always think of uh, bread breaking with Yera and that immediately taps me into that harvest feeling and that feeling of abundance and reaping what's been sown. 
With Wu Nyo, I see a P, the letter P, and that P stands for pleasure because Wu Nyo represents joy and light and lightheartedness and that feeling of kind of um, enjoying the feeling of, of being at one with your inner child, connected, celebrating, that kind of stuff. So for me, it's a, it's a P for pleasure for Wu Nyo, so that's pretty straightforward. Ehwaz is obviously the letter M, that's what it uh, looks like actually, so I think of that M as um, movement and the way that I differentiate it from uh, manas, in case anyone's wondering, is that with this M it's almost as if the M itself is free to move, whereas manas is kind of about that structured core where you see that centre point which represents the self. So when I used to worry that I'd get these two mixed up, I would always think to myself, okay, this M represents movement and freedom and that means the M is freed up, it doesn't have that shackle on it. And when I see manas, I see that central point as being the central point of self. So that's how I manage to uh, break them up because there are quite a few runes that are quite similar looking and I know that is a concern for new students. So Erhuaz for me represents movement um, because Erhuaz is about movement and progress and travel and such. Fairhu. Now for me Fairhu should be represented by tree branches. When I see Fairhu I think about branches rising up into the sky because Fairhu is about possessions, it's about land and that kind of thing. So it's about your homestead, it's about your habitat, it's about what's familiar but it's also about nourishment and it's about getting that good stuff that you need to progress and I like to see that as the tree being nourished and therefore the branches going outwards. So that's how I see Fairhu. Duggars. Uh, now, I see Duggars as doors, uh, you know, like those saloon doors that kind of swing open and close. I like to see Duggars like that because Duggars is really a rune about breakthrough and transformation. It's that it's that gateway rune. It's that uh, almost a, a rune that could represent enlightenment, but also could rep represent pragmatic change in the tangible realm. So when I see Duggars, I think of doors and I think about that doorway into another room or into the next part of the terrain. Uh, Tihuas, the warrior's rune, um, I see that as an arrow, uh, the arrow represents the warrior, this is all about standing your ground, uh, cultivating your personal power, going into any necessary battles, that kind of thing, so yeah, Tihuas, it's pretty straightforward, it's a spear or an arrow, so it's that warrior's rune, I've got that in mind all the time. Uh, Elgus or Algiz, or however you want to say it, there are some debates on this one, um, I've even heard Elhaz, Elhaz, uh, maybe, I'm not sure. <laughs> with this rune, I see a person with their arms outstretched because it's the rune of self-interest and it's the rune of really going after what you need and what you desire. I might speak a little bit more on the definitions for each rune at another point or maybe later on in this video, depending on how much time I've got, because obviously I'm being very rudimentary with the meanings of each rune at the moment and I'm sure there are a lot of very passionate um, rune lovers out there thinking, God, she's really boiling this down. There's so much more to each rune than that. And I would agree, I would quite agree. Um, each rune is very multifaceted. However, for the purposes of this video, I'm trying to explain why I see the pictures and use the symbols that I, I do for each rune. So uh, with Algus or Algiz, however you want to say it, I see these arms outstretched. I see a person who's in the center of their power and is concentrating on what they need for their development and for their self-interest. Burkano or Burkana, depending on how you want to say it. Uh, I see the letter B and I use that letter B to remind me of the words birth and beginning because Burkana can actually represent both. Uh, it represents growth and rebirth. It represents, you know, that life-death life cycle feeling of something beginning, um, that kind of thing. So I, I go for B for birth or beginning dependent upon the situation and how I feel I want to read it. Um, Ingus I see as a pregnant belly, that's how I see it, so you've got your arms here, you've got your legs here and this pregnant belly in the centre because Ingus again represents beginnings but it also represents fertility, it represents the seed of something coming into being and it often represents potential, that foundation for something to grow um, and maybe it's still in the very early stages but it's something that can be seen and is kind of becoming tangible so that's, that's how I see Ingus as, as the pregnant belly. Obviously, this is this does not mean that I would always read it as uh, 
you know, uh, um, that pregnancy is imminent or that somebody was pregnant recently or anything like that. I always see pregnancy as a metaphor f for fertility and that can go in any number of different ways. Uh, Gyebo, I see this as sealed with a loving kiss. <laughs> I kind of see this as a, a kiss motif because Gyebo is about gifts and partnership and collaboration and working alongside other people to achieve aims and objectives or simply just to achieve a heightened state of being in, you know, in all of those wonderful things like love and friendship and care and so on, compassion. So I see Gyebo as a, as a kiss, which is nice. <laughs> Hagalaz. Now, with Hagalaz, Hagalaz is actually Hell's rune, and Hell is my matron deity. So when Hagalaz comes up in a reading, I instantly think of Hell, because this is the rune that represents her, and it deals with things like disruption, elemental power, and having to yield to the forces of nature. Now, Hell is the Norse goddess of the underworld. So you can imagine that when Hagalaz comes up, it's almost like a rune of the law. It's kind of a way of saying that uh, certain things are going to come to pass that are out of your control, that are inevitable, and you must bend and yield to those changing winds. You know, there is no way to escape the inevitable or avoid the unavoidable. So in many different themes and, and aspects of life, this rune can come up, and it simply means that you're kind of fighting against a force that's too strong for you and that sometimes you must accept that certain things are going to come into being. Now, obviously, not many people watching this are going to have Hell as their matron deity, so it's going to be difficult for you to um, associate Hagalas with, um, with the Norse goddess of the underworld. So what I would advise instead is I think that it's probably a good idea to think of Hagalas as somewhat of a stop sign. So it's almost like this is the door and you want to walk through that door, but there's this kind of there's this stop sign feature or this kind of board that's preventing you from getting through to where you really want to get to. And that is when it comes to mind that Hagalaz is the rune of the law. So basically it's that elemental law, it's that underlying law that enables you to realise that even though sometimes you may want something very much, divine timing is not allowing you or the circumstances are not allowing you, and that's just the way that it is. So it's kind of quite a harsh. <laughs> read and I think that might be a good way to remember it uh, Rido Rido for me I see um, I used to see it in a, in a number of different ways but nowadays I see it as an R for reunion uh, Rido represents reunion journeys, communications meetups, that kind of thing uh, maybe meeting people halfway maybe having to go somewhere in order to plant the seed of change for something new to occur so I see Rido as reunion and this can be reunion with the self too. Urus, I try to imagine Urus as a human arm kind of flexing its muscles because Urus represents strength as well as both manhood and womanhood um, and all of the everything that that entails when it comes to strength and ability and vitality, tenacity, ambition, um, you know, being forward thinking, being steadfast, being stoical, kind of refusing to just uh, curl up in a ball and not fight the good fight. So Urus I always try and see as a human arm flexing its muscles. So I guess if, if it was to go the other way around it would kind of look uh, more like what it's supposed to be. But yeah, that's how I that's how I see Urus. Otila, um, I see someone walking away. Uh, you see that the legs are here so what I always think of is a person and I see the person's legs as being the central feature of this room because Otila represents separation and retreat um, and it also represents inheritance which could be remembered through this diamond shape um, so there's that double meaning with Otila which I use a different pictorial association for um, inheritance in terms of monetary inheritance is not always going to be what the rune is referring to it could be to do with emotional inheritance parental conditioning that you've inherited problems you've inherited because you've not dealt with them the first time around that kind of thing but all I really need in order to delve into those themes is just one little image that helps me to think what the rune means overall so for me if I wanted to go into that theme of inheritance I would instantly see this diamond and I'd think oh yeah there's quite a theme of of inheritance with Otilla and um, and the legs here would remind me of retreat withdrawal disappearing kind of running away to an extent so that's where I go with that uh, Legus I see a dowsing stick actually because Legus represents water it represents flow and it represents that which conducts so when I read that definition, I thought it's perfect to just think of a dowsing stick. So that's what I always think of with Legus. Uh, canars, I tend to think of um, an opening. 
uh, something opening up, like a, a letter or, um, you know, a packet of some kind. Because uh, Kainos represents openings as well as fires and torches and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, I, I often think of an opening and being able to look into something or being able to extract something that I maybe couldn't have extracted before. Um, Kainos is always a room that, that I've been quite able to remember the meaning for anyway. It's one that sticks in my brain. But I need to mention the other association, fire, torches, that kind of thing. So you've got that masculine go-getting um, uh, undercurrent, I suppose, with Kainos as well. And you might have to decide how you might want to remember that if you have difficulty doing so. Ihuaz is quite um, similar looking to Suwelu. Um, with Suwelu, though, you have the S shape kind of thing. And then with Ihuaz, you have one going down and one going up. So you don't get that lightning bolt feel with Ihuaz. So if you wanted to remember Suwelu by thinking about the lightning bolt, which is kind of coming down to earth, that will enable you to make sure you don't get it mi mixed up with Ihuaz, which is quite similar. But you have the arrow, the sorry, the arrows, the um, lines going the opposite way. With Ihuaz, I see a human body curled into the fetal position because Ihuas represents defence and aversive powers. So being able to keep yourself safe, being able to keep yourself tucked up, make sure that all of your limbs are safe, make sure that you've got your little place where you know um, that no one's going to get in and mess everything up. So it's kind of about defences and it's kind of about just ensuring that you're as safe as you can be for when the storm does come. So I always try and imagine somebody just getting into their little nook and kind of preparing to lock down for the winter, as it were. Uh, Thurisaz I see as a stop sign, you know like those signs on the side of the road that you see and it will say stop. I see it as a stop sign because Thurisaz represents a place of non-action. Uh, you could also see a human with their hand on their hip as if they're just kind of having a relax and you know not wanting to go into any full-on action for that moment in time. So that's another way that you could definitely read it. And finally, uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Perth Row. Perth Row I see as a secret container opening up. Um, and what I really like about Perth Row is it is the rune of secrecy and it is the rune of something that is hidden, something that is not yet come into being. So I like to think of it as one of those secret magic Chinese boxes or some kind of thing like that where it looks like it doesn't really have um, a way to get in or it looks like it's a big complicated puzzle and suddenly there's this illuminating opening of something and it's quite exciting. And also it makes me think that, you know, you can only really see the opening opening from one direction whereas this segment seems to be cut off you can't really see the secret or get into the meat of the thing from this side only from this side which again feeds to that aspect of secrecy that Perth Row actually represents. Uh, many people do not use the blank rune in a rune set because they feel that Perth Row actually acts perfectly as the blank rune. Um, the blank rune or the weird rune as they call it is also a rune of secrecy or rune of something not meant to be known yet and Perth Row actually does this job spectacularly well so I don't use the blank rune. Uh, many people think feel when they're reading runes that if Perth Row comes up as the first rune or as the first rune that's looked at or the first rune that's pulled from the bag it means that it's not a good time to do a reading it's an inopportune time because there will be things that have not quite come to the surface or the reading will not kind of uh, lend itself to the secretive energies that are around at that moment so Perth Row does its job as the weird rune I think by itself so many people will choose not to also have the blank rune when you know Perth Row does the job just as well. So, you know, these are my ways of memorising the runes in accordance with what they look like and the kind of images that I can attach to them that help me to better understand the symbolism. If you guys have any ideas or if this was helpful to you at all or, um, you know, if you have any questions at all about what I've uh, shown you here, then please feel free to leave them below. I really hope that this was helpful for you guys on your journey with the runes. Much love. Blessed be.